It's time now for our Common Ground segment. Joining us tonight are New York Republican Congresswoman Claudia Tenney and Illinois Democratic Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy. Uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, you know, we talk about all the things that both parties are different on. Uh, there are some big issues, obviously, that you all fight about. Uh, but one of the reasons we do this is to figure out where you might be able to find common ground. For the two of you who've worked together up on Capitol Hill, where is that? First to you, Congresswoman. Hi, well, this has been a great segment from you, and I just want to say thank you to you for doing this because uh, Rajna, uh, Representative Krishnamurthy and I came in as freshmen in, in 2016, and we signed a commitment to civility, and we were very committed to that. Uh, we made sure we did uh, legislation together, we worked together as freshmen, and we want to continue doing that. And so I think that uh, interesting that Raj and I actually have a lot in common that would be uh, surprising maybe to your audience. And one of those things is uh, dealing with global hunger. It's very important to us. Also dealing with the protests in China, uh, the protests in Iran, and freedom around the world, and supporting uh, democratic principles. So I think those would be the two big issues uh, that we uh, really come together on, and uh, I'm glad to be on with him. He's he's a fun guy and uh, actually fun to work with. A congressman. Hey, thank you so much, and I echo Claudia's sentiments. Uh, you know, one other thing that she didn't mention that we ha we share in common is that uh, I actually um, immigrated with my family to upstate New York uh, from India when we first. Uh, came to the United States when I was three months old. So I was born in New Delhi, India, and came from one of the hottest places in the world to one of the not so hot, uh, hottest places in the world in Buffalo, New York. Um, but in any case, uh, it, we work together on a number of issues, uh, as Claudia mentioned, and I'm so uh, happy to be on with you, Brett, and thank yeah. you for doing this. So uh, we talk about uh, China and the importance of that issue for the U.S. and. Uh, Congresswoman, you mentioned the protests that are going on there. What technically do you think you could do in Congress uh, to make your feelings known about that, that potentially affect the administrations? Yeah, well, we've been speaking out on this and doing letters and, and urging the administration to stand up for, for China, to stand up to the NBA and other players that are looking more like they're profiting from China, not willing to give that up in the name of freedom and in the name of recognizing some of these uh, these really courageous acts by these protesters who are standing up under these COVID lockdowns. But I think it's more than that. It's standing up to the Co Chinese Communist Party. And uh, some of this, I know we've looked at, I've been, you know, an advocate for fair trade versus free trade over the years, though, you know, certainly I want to see uh, the United States trade with the world, and China is a trading partner. But as uh, Raja indicated, I come from upstate New York, which was where the Industrial Revolution was started. And we, all these companies, these great iconic names, whether it's uh, IBM and uh, Rome Cable, uh, Revere Copper started by none other than uh, Paul Revere. All the, a lot of these companies, Oneida Limited, Oneida Silversmiths, a lot of these companies ended up in Asia or closing, and we lost a lot of them. So we are kind of like the Rust Belt of New York. And, you know, we have done a lot to try to bring those jobs back, bring our supply chain back, and, and to really encourage the administration and the other side to see that we need to talk about prosperity and bringing back uh, an economically friendly environment, which we don't really have in New York right now. And I would argue maybe not in Illinois or California where Raj is from. Yeah, Congressman, do you think that Congress fully appreciates the threat from China? And what can you all do on that in that regard? Um, I think that there's a, a growing recognition of the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. But I think that we need to act uh, more forcefully to protect ourselves. You know, under Chairman Xi Jinping, they've really consolidated their power. They're throwing their elbows militarily in their neighborhood, so to speak, whether it's the South China Sea or Taiwan or even India. Uh, they are also practicing unfair uh, economic uh, policies. Uh, they're dumping goods to try to undermine our industries. They're also conducting espionage on an industrial scale, and not just with regard to U.S. national security interests, but also uh, private, corporate, and business interests. And when you couple all that with their crackdown on human rights within the People's Republic of China, it's a dangerous brew and it poses a long-term threat to the United States and the world. Last thing with the two of you, you mentioned food security and there was a bill uh, that you both signed on to. Uh, Congresswoman, that's, that's something that maybe goes 
unreported a lot in the big picture of all the things we deal with, but we did a whole series on it. It's a big deal. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of people don't know what we do together as, as members in a bipartisan way because so much is focused on one side or the other. And, and global food security, global hunger is a real problem, especially in a lot of these countries where you've seen a downturn in their economies. You've seen more uh, dictatorships uh, arising and less interest uh, in, in really helping the neediest in those communities. And I think that's where you'll see more bipartisan step up, like the bill that that Mr. Uh, Christian Morthy and I, Raja, I should call you Raja, uh, the two of us, uh, co-sponsored. So there's a lot more going on that, that's good, but nobody really wants to talk about it. So we're really grateful to you for talking about these issues where we do come together. And I think even on some of the issues where we disagree, there is some common ground where we can come together and we can, can come up with some solutions as well. Do you think the election draws people apart, Congressman, and, and that maybe it's since it's post-election you, you feel better talking about it or are you talking about this all the time? We talk about it. And by the way, you can just call me Raja. I uh, I like to say my last name gets me on a first name basis with everyone. So, Claudia, <laughs> okay. you, you should definitely call me Raja. But um, going to your point, uh, yes, elections are kind of drawing us apart. Um, a lot of the rhetoric tends to pull us apart. But at the end of the day, we're all Americans. We have to pull together to face our common challenges, whether it's uh, food insecurity, which Congresswoman Tenney uh, eloquently spoke about, or whether it's the Chinese Communist Party threat or any number of other challenges. Um, what, what we share in common far surpasses what divides us. And we've got to grab a hold of those common values and work together uh, urgently for our children, our families, our communities, and our country. One of the things that we're looking at is what can be done in a lame duck Congress. Obviously, Republicans, Congresswoman, are looking to, you know, take control of the majority. And there's probably some reluctance uh, to, to do too much without you know, having the gavel. Where, where do you come down on that and, and what can be done in the final days here? Well, obviously, we're still in the minority. The majority is, is going to be determining uh, what gets done in the, in the last couple of weeks we have here of session. But uh, I'm hoping that we can get some kind of budget done. I'd like to see less spending. I'd like to see more focus on uh, prosperity and working on energy issues, which because I think they're critically important. Energy, in my opinion, is probably one of the most important issues facing our nation and our world. We have to have affordable, reliable energy. And uh, some of the aspects of the Green New Deal that are being pushed uh, by the people on the left, I think are harmful. And we're seeing this problem. Not only is it harmful in terms of lack of prosperity, but it's also being leveraged around the world, whether it's by Putin and Russia to the Chinese Communist Party and other players who really don't care what we do in terms of the United States. But, you know, energy is really critically important. My new district actually has all of the nuclear power plants in the state of New York. So it's going to be critically important moving forward that we find uh, energy sources that are emission free like nuclear, but also reliable. And with the number one ag district in the Northeast, we can't just go to electrification at the at the pace that is being pushed by the government in New York State and our federal government right now under control of the Democrats. Mm -hmm. So I see it's a big issue right now. For Congressman, me. Uh, we get on left and right frustration about eternally going up against these fiscal cliffs. And suddenly there's this massive omnibus bill or a continuing resolution, which is worse if you're in an agency that needs the certainty of funding. Do you think that we're ever going to break that cycle up there on Capitol Hill? I sure hope so, Brett. I was a small businessman before I came to Congress, and you couldn't run a small business or any private enterprise the way that we run the government. Not that the government needs to run like a business, but there needs to be some forethought with regard to um, how we uh, spend resources, our precious resources, and how do we do so strategically. So I'm on the House Intelligence Committee, as you know, and you know our national security agencies, our military cannot run on a continuing resolution. They can't, uh, for instance, invest in next generation systems to protect the homeland or to protect our war fighters if they don't know what the uh, spending or funding streams are going to be uh, one or two or three years out. So uh, for that reason and others, 
we've got to um, you know engage in a little more uh, long-term planning and less crisis management. Mm -hmm. Congressman, since you're on House Intel, I've been asking most people on Intel or Foreign Affairs or Defense, uh, knowing what they know, what would they tell kids about TikTok? I have two kids who I'm trying <laughs> to get off TikTok, and I'm telling them, listen to these lawmakers who know. What would you tell them? Well, golly gee, uh, you know, I've got three of my own and uh, I can't get them off TikTok either, Brett. But um, what I have said is no government uh, employee, whether it's a, a federal employee or for that matter, a state employee should be using TikTok. And if you're in the private sector, you should be very circumspect. Why? Because TikTok is owned by a company called ByteDance. It's a Chinese company. And Chinese companies are required by the Chinese Communist Party to comply with their requests the government's request to share information about their users. Not only that, but ByteDance and Chinese companies are not allowed to disclose when they've shared that information with the Chinese Communist Party. And recently, Forbes did a very interesting article talking about how ByteDance actually instructed TikTok to collect information on specific American citizens um, that is deeply disturbing. And for that reason, um, you know, I, I personally think that we have to view TikTok as a, as a national security risk. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple more things. Congresswoman, do you think it's going to be Speaker McCarthy come January 3rd? Uh, yes, I do. I think it might take a couple of rounds, but I think that at this point, I think some of us who uh, may be taken for granted or were, were reliable votes on the conservative side, you know, I support Speaker McCarthy. I think he deserves a chance to, to lead. And I think some of those that are objecting ought to give him that chance. And if they don't uh, like what, how he leads, then we have a chance to revisit this issue. But I think right now, with such a slim majority, I, I, we really need to, to really shore up our, our, uh, our conference, something the Democrats did very well, by the way, under mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi. I almost thought they could vote on almost anything as long as Pelosi got the, and she could whip those votes and get everybody to vote almost in lockstep with her. So I think it's important that we, we lead, uh, we, we actually represent our districts, but also make sure that we run the government and we need to run it uh, efficiently. I know in my first term we were in the majority and I think the government ran pretty well at that point. Although at that time we had a slim majority in the Senate and we also had a, a Republican in the White House. Yeah, there'll be some majorities uh, this time around, no doubt <laughs> yeah. about it. Uh, Congresswoman, you mentioned uh, China and food security. Is there something else that you would pick up the phone and call uh, Raja, let's say, use his first name, uh, and say, <laughs> let's get a deal on something else? Well, obviously, I mentioned energy, but I think one of, I, I agree with them on TikTok. It's funny how much we're agreeing here because, uh, you know, my son is actually a Marine and uh, he would tell me, don't get on Facebook, don't do social media, because that's the first thing we check. And that's what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, too. And I think that uh, I would probably call him up and say, what do we do about spending inflation and taxes? Because that's what affects my district. Uh, I have a lot of ag and uh, we have issues that are feeding the world. So when you talk about global food security, you know, some of the, the farmers in my district actually export uh, the food that they create uh, in New York State in a very short growing season, and it's critically important to us. So lower taxes, uh, affordable energy, those things are going to be critical for the future. I'd love to be able to call Rajab and say, where can we come uh, to some middle ground on energy and making sure that we are still productive, we're prosperous, and we have a reliable energy source that will lo lead us into the future and not something that takes us down a, a path of, of really, I think, a dangerous path of, of, of lack of security, lack of prosperity in our communities. And we're already starting to see that in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. Just like California, we're experiencing brownouts as well and energy problems, problems with diesel fuel uh, shortages, those things that are necessary to fuel our small businesses and our farms. And I still am a small business owner. We have a small manufacturing business in upstate New York that we've had since 1946. It is harder and harder and harder to do business with a very, very progressive uh, government in Albany. Congressman, last word. Uh, does your leadership encourage doing business with the other side like this, like we're talking about? 
Absolutely. And I, I, if I had a chance, I'd pick up the phone and, and call uh, Claudia and say, hey, let's work on skills-based and vocational education modernization. Um, this is a passion of mine. Um, I think that we spend way too much time uh, and focus on uh, four-year colleges and universities uh, as being the primary vehicle for post-secondary education when roughly two-thirds of Americans uh, don't have a four-year college degree. And so we've got to upskill people uh, to be able to get access to what I call the greatest social welfare program devised by human beings, and that's a J-O-B. We need them to have a job and a, uh, a kind of a ladder into the middle class. And if they want to get um, a four-year college degree, God bless them. But everyone, every child, every student needs to have skills uh, to be able to participate in this global workforce. Well, thank you both uh, for being on Common Ground. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.